This session will introduce you to the notation of time series. Ordinarily, in time series, you will have observed something like the demand for a product at fixed intervals, such as weeks or months. Then you try to fit that data to a model to make a forecast of the future. We will, for instructional purposes, do the opposite. We will pretend that we are the oracle who knows the model and then infer what the observations will look like. Suppose you are planning to create a supply chain simulation like the one we use at UT, and you need to create a mechanism for generating the demand. Let T denote the week number starting with week 1 and going through week N. In the example that we're going to introduce, we will let N equal 50, or 50 weeks. And for each week, we define a random variable, Z sub T, that denotes the demand. Z sub T is a time series, a set of random variables occurring at discrete intervals of time. We call the underlying process the time series, and we will call a particular sequence of numbers that the process generates an observation of the time series, or the data generated by the time series. To get started, let's set Z1 equal to 30. Z1 is deterministic for this particular time series. Then each week after week 1, let Z sub t be one more or one less than the previous week. The probability of each of these outcomes will be one half. We will generate these outcomes by flipping a coin or rolling a die. For example, week 2 will have an outcome of Z2 equal 29 or Z2 equal 31. Then this will become the starting point for week 3. For example, if week 2 turns out to be 31, then week 3 will be either 32 or 30. This type of time series is called a random walk. Usually with a random walk, the week-to-week -week change has a normal distribution. But to simplify this example, we have made it plus or minus 1. Here are 10 examples of possible outcomes over 50 weeks. We call each of these 10 sets of 50 numbers an observation of the time series, or the data for the time series. In the real world, you would have observed one of these and would have to work with that. Some of these observations trend upward, some trend downward, and some more or less end up where they started. Here is what will happen in the real world. You will have observed the time series up to a particular week, say week 15, and you need to forecast what will be happening in week 16 and beyond. Now the terminology. On the left, the Z has a hat over it. That means that rather than denoting an observation of a value, it denotes a forecast of a future value. The T subscript tells us when we are making the forecast. The L in the parenthesis tells us how far into the future we are for forecasting. So T plus L is the week we are forecasting. For example, Z sub 15 parenthesis 5 says we are forecasting in week 15, as the subscript indicates. We are forecasting what will be happening five weeks into the future, as the value in the parenthesis indicates. So we are making a forecast of what will be happening in week 20, and we are making that forecast in week 15. We know that our time series is equally likely to go up or down, so the best forecast happens to be the most recently observed value. This is the rule that we use for our, the random walk model. This is a special case where all the future forecasts made at a given time are the same. There's no trend or no seasonal pattern. We want to quantify the quality of the forecast so we define the forecast error as the difference between what we eventually observe and what we had forecasted earlier, the actual minus the forecast. A quick way to remember this is that they are in alphabetical order, actual minus forecast. 
And the other convention is that we will associate the error with the period in which the forecast was made rather than the period in which the actual value occurred. Here is the formula. The actual minus the forecast that we made earlier and we associate this error with the period in which the forecast was made. We call this error E sub T parenthesis L. The forecast was made in period T. We forecasted L periods into the future and then we associate the difference between the actual and the forecast with period T. For example, if we suppose that at time 15 we observed z sub t equal 25 and that is our forecast for period 20. We wait till period 20 rolls around and the outcome is 28. Our error for period 15 is 3. Note that a positive error means that our forecast was too low. A negative error means that our forecast was too high. Note that we have a bunch of possible forecast errors that we can associate with period 15. The error for the forecast one period into the future, two periods, three, or any other value of L that we choose. Let's focus on the one period ahead forecast error. It will always be either plus one or minus one. That will be E sub T parenthesis 1. For example, in period 1 we forecast that 30 will be the outcome in period 2. In period 2, if we observe 29, then E sub 1 parenthesis 1 is minus 1, 29 minus the forecast of 30. The measure of the quality of the forecast that we will use is the standard deviation of the one period ahead forecast errors. And we call that number the standard error. Ordinarily, when you compute a standard deviation, you measure deviations from an average. In time series, we measure deviations from zero and we call that the standard error. We first square all of the errors. In this case, that will always give us one. Then we take the average of these squared errors and we call that the mean squared error. Then we take the square root of the mean squared error and we call that the standard error and we're going to denote that by sigma sub e and on the next slide we're going to show you the mathematical formula. For example, if our observed time series has 50 values then we have seen the outcome associated with the forecast that we made in periods 1 through 49, and we haven't yet observed the outcome for the forecast made in period 50. So we have 49 errors. If we square the errors, they're all plus or minus 1, to get 1s. We add them up and divide by 49 to get the average of 1. That is our mean squared error. Then we take the square root to get the standard error, which in this case is also 1. In the next session, we will learn how to compute the standard deviation of the multi-period forecast, for example, when you're forecasting two or more periods into the future. We know that as we forecast farther into the future, this standard deviation will get larger. And it sounds messy to compute, but there's some good news. Once we get the one period ahead standard deviation, or the standard error, then we can adjust this to get the multi-period standard deviation.